What does the Elite 11 tournament in LA? Kion leads commitment to Ohio State and two Buckeye recruits that will be announcing where they will play college football all on July 1st have to do with each other. You can hear all about them right here during today's show with John Garcia Jr. of Sports Illustrated. This show, you don't want to miss it. You can only catch it right here on Locked on Buckeyes. You are Locked on Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Buckeye fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Buckeyes. For the Locked On Podcast Network, I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the J. Stevens Podcast. It is Wednesday, June 29th in the year 2022, and I want to thank you for making Locked On Buckeyes your first listen or first watch of every single day. On today's episode, we get a second dose of John Garcia Jr. in this week right here on today's podcast. John Garcia Jr., is the Director of Football Recruiting at Sports Illustrated. He is currently in L.A. getting ready for the Elite 11 quarterback competition. We open up today's conversation discussing what to expect at Elite 11 and what we can expect from Austin Novosad and Brock Glenn, two guys at Ohio State, two quarterbacks that Ohio State is currently going after. I want to timestamp this once again because this was recorded just a day ago, and we all know how things are. There might be a commitment between the time John and I recorded and the time you listened to the episode. So if you're wondering why something was left out, it was because it was recorded prior to the announcement. I'm backing away. Let's bring in John Garcia Jr. and allow him to talk about Kion Lee and two guys that will be making their announcements about where they'll play college football on July 1st. Athletes are quickly making their decisions about where they're going to play football in college. We got three recently. We just got another one with Kyan Lee earlier this week. And back with us again today is John Garcia Jr. He's on the road right now at the Elite 11. I'm glad he could join us for this week's show. John, welcome to the podcast. Always good to be on with you, Jay. And yeah, every week it seems like there's some new Buckeyes uh, to talk about in the recruiting game. So happy to catch up with you. I'm happy you're here as well. I know you're busy right now, but you're currently also at Elite 11. And there's two Ohio State guys, well, Ohio State recruits that Ohio State has kind of focused on. Both have taken official visits to Ohio State. Austin Novosad still committed to Baylor. Will he flip to Ohio State or somewhere else? That's to be determined. But also Brock Glenn, who is not committed yet to any school. What are some things you're looking forward to about these two guys while you're out there in L.A.? Well, they're two of the hottest quarterbacks in the country, right? Obviously, Ohio State is, is one of the most recent offers for each of them, um, and they've proven it in these kind of settings all off season. So I'm looking forward to seeing them continuing it with a better group of uh, competitors uh, out here in L.A. Obviously, it's a strong year at the position uh, at the very top, and 17 of these 20 quarterbacks are already committed. Uh, so they've really got nothing left to prove in recruiting, but they do want to come out here, compete, and, and potentially win the Elite 11. So I'm looking forward to seeing how both Glenn and, and Novosad stack up. And yeah, both of their recruitments are still very much open. Like you said, uh, Novosad committed to Baylor, but Ohio State and Texas A&M got him on visits. Stanford, another school that, that is trying to change his mind. So we'll certainly look to talk to him at some point this week for a quick update. I'm sure he's glad the dead period is here and he doesn't have to hit the road and he could start to focus on these schools. And then with Brock Glenn, yeah, he wanted to be committed by today, but uh, obviously not the case. A lot of schools got involved late, uh, including LSU, his most recent offer, but most people still consider this, and I'm in this group, more of an Auburn and Ohio State battle. Florida State's done a good job. LSU's the new school in the mix. TCU got the first official visit, so they're not out of it, according to Glenn as of uh, this past weekend, uh, but certainly we feel like Auburn and Ohio State are the two most likely destinations for him. So curious to see how he deals with that while trying to compete. Certainly not an easy task. What kind of things will they be doing up there in L.A. with the other group of quarterbacks that will be participating in this event? 
Yeah, each day is, is very different. So uh, Tuesday evening will be kind of an extension of what they've already done, right? So the Elite 11 regionals were all over the country where all these guys earned tickets here to Los Angeles for the final. And it's basically a station accuracy type of camp where you're rotating through different groups, working with college counselors. Uh, who, we Maybe CJ Stroud will be out here as well. A lot of college counselors will be out. And of course, the Elite 11 staff will be evaluating uh, throughout the day. So will we. We'll have rankings every day at SI. And then on Wednesday, it's uh, more scripted. It is a pro day style workout uh, between 15 and 20 throws scripted in nature. All of them will go through the exact same uh, plethora of throws. Uh, we have a scoring system at SI that we keep track of, and uh, so does the Elite 11. So we'll basically have a, a one-to-one -one look at every single quarterback. So it's a very good comparison day naturally. And then day three uh, on Thursday is is up in the air. Last year, they did like an accuracy challenge at the beginning, which, which was kind of like an obstacle course that had time associated with it. And then they also did some seven-on-seven -seven with some receivers in DB. So we're looking forward to seeing which skill position prospects show up uh, to team up with some of these quarterbacks. So it's, it's kind of an annual rite of passage uh, at the Elite 11. And yeah, Ohio State is, is quite familiar. I think C.J. Stroud, really, this event was what propelled him to that national level. I don't think he had an offer from Ohio State at this point during uh, his, his junior season going into his senior year. And this event put him on the national map, and, and he outdueled Bryce Young to win that Elite 11. So looking forward to seeing who can do so this year. Looking forward to hearing from you and seeing some things on Twitter as far as what's going on out there in L.A. at Elite 11. But I'm also for looking forward to hearing from you right now in regards to what your thoughts are about the most recent book I commit, Mr. Kyan Lee. What were your thoughts when he announced his commitment earlier this week? Big win for Ohio State. I, I think we, we can kind of fall into the trap, Jay, of when it's Ohio State and Georgia and Alabama and Clemson, we, we fall into the trap of, okay, they're great schools and they're getting great players. Yeah. Whoop-de-doo. No big deal. But this was a big deal. I mean, this kid was committed to Georgia uh, during that national title run. Of course, there was a lot of staff turnover in Athens. The defensive coordinator is now the head coach at Oregon, uh, which did continue to recruit Lee and hosted him for a visit, by the way. And then the DB coach goes down to Miami, where he also took a visit. So optically, three or four months ago, I think Ohio State would have been an underdog in this recruitment. Uh, but OSU stayed consistent. Kerry Coombs and company on that side of the ball uh, certainly uh, put in good work here. And he took the most recent trip up uh, to Columbus and, and fell in love with that with that part of, of the recruiting process. So he ends up a Buckeye over Georgia, which continued to recruit him, over Oregon and Miami, which have coaches that he has already committed to once before. So, again, from, from 30,000 feet, you say, okay, Another blue chip DB headed to OSU, but in reality, this was an underdog or a, a, a recruitment where Ohio State wasn't really the favorite at any point. Uh, so to win it, uh, I think, is a really big deal. And, and you look at the tape, and man, this is as polished a DB as we've seen on tape to date. He can play corner. He can play nickel. Extremely high floor here. He might not be the longest or fastest DB but it's certainly comfortable running with, with receivers, uh, really attacks the football at a high level. He competes at the line of scrimmage and at the catch point, some traits that really translate to the nickel position, uh, which is a starter nowadays. So this is, again, a high floor prospect where you just expect him to get on the field pretty early, regardless of where he goes, even at a school that is kind of known uh, for producing DBs like Ohio State. We are here with John Garcia Jr. He is the director of football recruiting at Sports Illustrated. I had read a little bit about this young man, and I saw, I think it was a part of 247 Sports, their evaluation of him. They said he they, he has been clocked in at a 4-4, 4-4-40. All right, cool. Like, that's, that's not slow. That's decent speed on the football <laughs> field. But I keep also reading that maybe on the field speed might not be his strong suit, which kind of confuses me because when I hear 4-4, I hear I see speed and I think fast. But also seeing that maybe that might not translate to the field might concern me a little. What have you seen with him, with your evaluation of him as a football player? Yeah, I'm not concerned. Uh, I, I think, you know, certainly a, a hand time 4-4 is very fast. I think we all can can recognize that. But it also doesn't always indicate uh, what we see on Friday nights. But with Lee 
who, who comes from Cedar Grove High School uh, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, a lot of great competition in that area. And there's really not a whole lot of evidence of him being unable to keep up with some of the premier pass catchers uh, around that city. So uh, we have also seen him uh, in the camp circuit and the combine circuit this off season. And that's really never come up in the conversation. Like, man, he can't run. Like there's, there's no uh, worry in my mind uh, of that for Lee, but, but I do think his polish, his technique, his comfort with the football in the air and his ability to attack the football could move him throughout the secondary where you don't look at it as he can't run well enough to play corner, but it's more so he does so many things well, you can use him at corner or move him inside uh, potentially for for a nickel type role, which is uh, important for Ohio State, right? Yes. You know, um, Deshaun Johnson, the corner who's already committed, a bigger, longer boundary type corner, kind of a classic mold of a zone corner there. So you need some compliments uh, to that as you build the rest of this cornerback class. And I know with, with Hawkins, the kid from Cocoa, Florida, he's got safety and nickel experience. So now you're stacking great DBs together who complement one another. And all of a sudden you're building what, what is starting to look like a, a starting four or five uh, secondary uh, in this class of, of 2023. And, and that's always ideal in the past first nature of the game. John, there's a trend that we, you and I discuss all the time. It is versatility. We talk about it a lot with the receivers that recently committed saying they can play inside at slot or outside receiver. And that versatility that Bri versatility Brian Hartline wants these guys are bringing to the table. But we've also talked about with the offensive line. Can you play guard? Can you play center? Can you play guard or tackle? Versatility there. But we're also talking about versatility in the defensive back room and that field there. I don't know if this is a Ryan Day staple that he just wants versatility, but I like it. Like, I love hearing about how versatile these guys are, knowing how physical you need to be to be a nickel corner and how really refined and how te uh, technical you need to be to be outside. Well, technical no matter where. The more of those technique type things are needed on the outside at corner. I love the vers versatility you're saying about this young man. And this is a trend that I think Ryan Day is going to continue. Elite prospects, they're not just one thing, not an outside or inside receiver, an outside corner or a nickel corner. They could do multiple things and you find the best spot for them on your on your team and allow them to flourish the job. I love it because these guys aren't shying away. These athletes aren't shying away from using everything in their bag once they get to the campus when they play college football. 100%. You know, again, you know, it's it's basketball on grass, right? Yeah. So you think of a great basketball team defensively, and those are players who can guard more than one position, right? You think of your, your Draymond Green types, you know, winning the title this year. He can guard, you know, three or four positions. And I think when, when you talk about secondary prospects, that's what you're looking at, right? Because yeah. if you're in – if you're playing nickel – you could be guarding a 5'9 a wide receiver. Uh, you could be assisting on a tight end who's 6'6", 240. And you could also have some underneath zone responsibility on a crossing route from a big receiver or even a running back out of the backfield. So you've got to be able to combat different body types and different positions all together. So when we talk about the modern DB, when we throw out the word nickel, it is really one of the highest compliments we can give because that is a player who you're subbing in uh, for an offense or an outside linebacker for, right? You're taking out an outside linebacker, bringing in a nickel. So inevitably some of those bigger physical run first responsibilities will carry over into the nickel type. And I think Kay and Lee has some of those traits in his bag. So to be able to do that and also cover at a high end power five, you know, a high, almost NFL level, I do think that really says a lot uh, about the modern defensive back. Again, the more you can do, the sooner you see the field, the more trust the coaching staff has in you. And, and we see a lot of that in the league. From one athlete who just committed to be a Buckeye earlier this week to a couple more that are making their decisions on July 1st at the end of this week. First up is Daniel Harris. He is 6'2". I got him listed at 175. Down in Miami where you just moved to, well, moved back to, schools that I saw on the graphic that are in the final running that he is going to be picking to play at. Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State, and Georgia. I think we, you and I have talked about him before. I can't remember if we have, but his name does sound familiar. What do you like about his game? Well, extremely long. You mentioned it. 6'2", 180 pounds or so. And Daniel utilizes that, that length at the line of scrimmage especially. He really can disrupt the timing 
other wide receivers release, and that's paramount in terms of slowing down these offenses. So much we see, whether it's the RPO game, whether it's one-on-one, uh, it's timing-based, right? So if you have the length to disrupt that, uh, you're already at an advantage uh, right there at the line of scrimmage. But he's also got this range, uh, long body, long stride, and, and he's got these ball skills to go along with it to where he can really attack the football. You think of another modern element of offensive football, what do we see? Back shoulder balls, 50-50 balls. Uh, basically, my guy's better than you, and the quarterback trusts that. So the longer the DB, the more comfortable with the ball in the air, the more successful and the more valuable he'll be in general. So we've seen Harris collect, I don't know, 40 offers at this point. So to be down to four, we know he's getting really close. And this thing's fluctuated. I think early on, there was a lot of hometown Miami feel. The SEC was going to factor in, and, and now Georgia's the only school from that conference still in the mix. And obviously the Big Ten has really impressed him taking officials to Columbus, uh, to College State, or excuse me, to Happy Valley uh, State College, of course, uh, as well as to Ann Arbor. Uh, I think all those schools are pushing. I think Michigan is, and Ohio State could be recruiting him the most consistently. Uh, so I do think that that factors in. I'm curious to learn more of Georgia's angle here. I do think regionally, of course, that's the closest to home. Um, his older brother plays at Texas A&M, so there's some SEC on SEC uh, potential there for him to play against him at the next level, always appealing. But Georgia's stacking up, just like Ohio State, a pretty nice secondary room on their own end. So you wonder how much Georgia pushes. I do think um, in the last uh, few days, that answer could help dictate where Harris winds up. Uh, but even if Georgia's pedal to the metal, you know Ohio State can go down and compete. And heck, the last guy we talked about to form a Georgia commitment. So <laughs> I do think we see a lot of these Ohio State-Georgia battles on the trail, right? Caleb Downs was just up there. I think he's another one uh, to keep an eye on in this same light. Uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, if you're an Ohio State fan, keep an eye on Kirby Smart, keep an eye on Nick Saban, as you typically do, because those three schools overlap a ton when it comes to secondary recruiting. And, and Daniel Harris will be the next guy up uh, July 1st, like you said. We are here with John Garcia Jr. He is the director of football recruiting at Sports Illustrated. I did not plan on this being a, a show primarily talking about cornerbacks. Uh, I know we talked about elite 11 quarterbacks at the beginning, but I never generally try to have, I do sometimes try to have uh, one like position specific, but it wasn't my plan today. It just happened to be that as I'm preparing to talk to John, the Kai, Kai and Lee's commitment came up. Okay, let me put that in the note. And then I saw Daniel Harris. Oh, let me put that there. I, and then the next guy we're going to talk about, I was like, oh, well, so he's made what kind of wound, wound things down as well. And he's, he's made a announcement about when he's going to make his announcement. It just happened to be that this is how the, everything fell. We talked about Kai and Lee and how he can play outside or inside corner, maybe even a little safety as well. With Daniel Harris, do you think he's going to be more of an outside or inside guy? I think he's a boundary corner. I think he's similar to Dejon Johnson, the other okay. corner uh, that Ohio State has committed, similar in body type and mentality. I do think Harris runs a little bit better at this stage, and he's uh, just combated better competition playing in Miami, which is arguably the most competitive area in the country. So I do think he's a little bit more ready to play early. I think Johnson down the line could have more upside as he refines his technique a little bit. So that's another element of secondary recruiting that probably doesn't get talked about enough is staggering developed and polished prospects with young, raw, high upside and developmental types who could uh, supplement your depth down the line and eventually become, you know, your all Big Ten type performer. So I do think that's another strong element of what Ohio State appears to be building in this class of 2023. Guys who are closer to, to being ready today, like a Kyan Lee, guys who maybe need some time, like a Johnson, or guys who are kind of in the middle. I think that's where Daniel Harris lies uh, in the conversation as well. So it, it's good to stagger that talent at every position, and, and the secondary is, of course, included. Who do you think currently has the upper hand between these four schools? I, I do feel like this is an Ohio State-Georgia battle. Uh, he's fresh off of that Columbus official. I do think – uh, that matters uh, in this in this part of the conversation. Again, I, I have heard today even that Michigan is really all in on Harris. So if there's a dark horse, keep an eye on the Wolverines. But look, they've had a lot of staff turnover as well. And and frankly, they haven't recruited as, as high a clip 
as we would have maybe expected coming off of that uh, college football playoff run. Uh, so I do think that going head to head with Ohio State, Georgia, and, and even Penn State is a lot to ask for Michigan. If, if he were to pick UM, I think that'd be a banner recruiting win for Jim Harbaugh and company, but it's hard to project that at this point. Last but not least, it is Jermaine Matthews Jr., someone that has – he's, he's an Ohio kid from Cincinnati at Whitten Woods High School. And this one I think is the most interesting about among – I think anybody you and I have talked about, John, from Nova Sod being at Baylor, then taking an official visit to Ohio State, to Kion Lee and then uh, him being committed and decommitted to Georgia and everything that happens there. I think this is the first person – that has put Jackson State in his final group of schools among anybody we have talked about. We know Deion Sanders is doing amazing things down there in the South. He's trying to change the mindset and have a paradigm shift uh, with a lot of the mindsets and the thoughts that go in people's minds about HBCUs. This is an Ohio kid that's considering going down South. Another cornerback um, recently took an official visit to Ohio State earlier this month in the middle of the month. What do you like about this kid when you watch him play football? Yeah, compared to a lot of these guys, Jay, he's the riser, right? We talk about Lee and we talk about Harris, guys who for two, three years have been on SEC, Big Ten, major college football radar. This kid is is like months into his, his sort of breakout. And I think that uh, really was elevated this summer, uh, c- camping at Ohio State, which where we've seen Ryan Day and company really trusting those in-person evaluations. So he gets his Buckeye offer, I believe June 1st, like the first camp uh, of the entire off season for the Bucks. Uh, and then he follows it up with, with an official visit, of course. And really since that point, everybody's jumped in. You know, I just saw LSU was, was his most recent scholarship offer. You mentioned Jackson State trying to pull him uh, out of <laughs> Big Ten country. And hey, you know, we shouldn't discount Dion, especially right. the secondary prospects right. at this point. But look, he's a Winton Woods kid. He's an Ohio kid. I do think, you know, there's a little added pressure for Ohio State to evaluate more carefully in state. When you offer a kid like that, a local kid or a semi local kid, you got to be ready to take them. And I do think from that moment, June 1st, uh, so just less than a month ago, Really, his rise uh, has been cemented uh, with that Ohio State offer. I do believe he's a take with the Bucks, and, and I think that's where he ends up at this point. Of this group of prospects who are close to deciding, I do think that this is the safest Ohio State bet among them. Uh, again, you, you don't offer this kid in state if you're not ready to accept his verbal commitment. Um, other schools have certainly made similar charges in the last few weeks and months, um, but but again, uh, with his position, uh, and he's a high floor kid. You know, we've watched his rise, um, and we like him. You know, he's physically mature, six foot, one eighty five, one ninety or so. So he's really uh, in that kind of ideal range, height and weight wise, um, for for corners, uh, secondary prospects in general. Uh, so I do think the floor is really strong here, and it just took some time for him to, I guess, prove it and show it at the highest level, but uh, better late than never. We've seen Ohio State do this time and time again, especially again with regional prospects where you just got to recruit more carefully, right? There's a lot more, I guess, potential for for blowback if it doesn't work out. So I do think that uh, being deliberate here uh, was a really smart and patient play by OSU. And and I do believe uh, it will pay off barring an upset. I mentioned Jackson State. Some of the other schools that are in the final six for Jermaine Matthews Jr., Penn State, Oklahoma, LSU, as you mentioned, and then then Cincinnati right there where he lives. They're going after him as well. Cincinnati going to be in the Big 12, I want to say in 23, maybe 24. I forget exactly when, maybe 23. And so there's a lot. I mean, he's not getting, like, bad offers. I mean, if Jackson State's offering you a scholarship, I'm – considering that myself because I know what Deion Sanders is trying to do down there in the South, especially with HBCUs. Ohio State's different, as you mentioned, and I think that they have an ability right now to do something that LSU can't do, Jackson State can't do, is to keep that communication and maybe even see him more often, um, as much as they can legally, to see him because of where they are in location to where Matthews is from. So I, I – I'm hoping, of course, I hope everybody goes to Ohio State that that's, that gets an offer, but I understand uh, that's, not, that's not possible. But from what you said, I do 
like what I'm hearing, and I would enjoy him being a Buckeye. Do you have any last comments about Matthews Jr. before we close up shop? Yeah, I mentioned Kerry Coombs. Obviously, he's no longer uh, there at OSU. He's at Cincinnati, of course, yes. uh, where, where he's recruiting Matthews uh, there. And, and there's uh, one of his uh, teammates in the secondary just committed to the Bearcats to stay home. So you certainly understand the hyper-local pull uh, there from the Bearcats. Uh, but look, I mean, I think even Luke Fickle will tell you that uh, look, the Ohio State offer hits different, uh, especially in-state, especially at that position. Uh, so I do think uh, this is uh, a rare head-to-head between Ryan Day and, and, and Fickle himself. Uh, but I do think, as most uh, cases uh, show us, that Ryan Day's got the edge uh, headed into this one. But look, I mean, who could, who could you know, go against Cincinnati right now, right? Especially defensively. They just had two corners drafted, yeah. including one in the top 10. I mean, you get it. It's, it's easy to sell that, especially to a local prospect. But there's a reason why he – coveted that Ohio State offer. He went out twice in the month of June to Columbus, once to work out and once uh, for the official visit. So I do think the Buckeyes have the upper hand here, but uh, it'll be interesting. I'll be tuned in for sure. John, if you could, let everyone know where they can catch you on Twitter and then follow along because you're out there at Elite 11 watching these quarterbacks participate in this phenomenal event. Yeah, it's um, John Garcia underscore JR. Um, We're also at at SI All-American on all social channels. And yeah, we'll be uh, staying up late, uh, getting some uh, some rankings and evaluations in on the nation's best quarterback. So certainly, we hope you check it out. And you guys can follow me on Twitter at jsteven07. I love having John on. Can't wait to have him on again. My guess, my gut says by the next time we have John on the show, there will be one, maybe two, maybe three commitments between now yes. and then. And so I'm anticipating having John on to discuss guys that have committed to Ohio State and what they bring to Ohio State and the recruiting class as a whole. John, thank you for coming back on the podcast again. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Jay. Take care.